Halloween is upon us, sometimes known as Fright Night. It's the season of scary movies, haunted houses, jack-o'-lanterns, and children calling out, trick-or-treat. Now, some of these features are harmless in and of themselves. I mean, who doesn't feel for Linus waiting in the patch for the great pumpkin to arrive, right? <clears throat> Yet we cannot escape the fact that Halloween is a holiday built on fear. Maybe that's why it's my least favorite holiday. <clears throat> As we conclude our series, Haunted by Your Past, we address the problem of fear. Now, unlike the previous issues that we've dealt with, fear deals with the present and the future. Shame and guilt and even false guilt and grief is usually rooted in the past. Fear is more about the present and the future. The good news, though, is that we can overcome it. You don't have to be freaked by fear. I want to begin this morning by considering the definition of fear. What do we mean? Webster defines it as an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. So it can be something real or it can be something we think might happen. Both of them cause the same reaction, whether it's real or not. Carol Kent writes in her book, Tame Your Fears, there are basically three kinds of fear. Holy fear, self-preserving fear, and slavish fear. The first comes from our reverence and our awe of God who created us and loved us. This is the fear of the Lord the Bible talks about, and it is a positive thing. The second has everything to do with the God-given instinct to run from danger, to avoid an accident, to protect ourselves and others. The third is a negative type that kills expressions of love, plugs lines of communication, imprisons victims of abuse, taunts with ridiculous phobias, controls by manipulation, and erodes all confidence and security. Wise, self-preserving fear shifts into a slavish fear when it becomes obsessive and controlling. That's when fear gets out of hand. Those first two types of fear are actually healthy. But it's the last one that most people get hung up on. That's the one we have trouble with. That slavish fear. We might call it fearfulness. Fearfulness suggests living in a state of fear. It is not just an occasional occurrence, it is an ongoing way of life. That's when it becomes unhealthy. One author wrote in Christianity Today, fear was designed by God to give our bodies the sudden bursts of strength and speed we need in emergencies. But when fear becomes a permanent condition, it can paralyze the spirits, keeping us from taking risks of generosity, love, and vulnerability that characterize citizens of God's kingdom. What he described there is that fight-or-flight reaction that our body has when we are confronted by fear. And again, that is God-given. God made us that way, and that's a good thing in those moments. Problem is, when we live in perpetual fear, our body is always on high alert. Adrenaline is pumping through our system, and it can have negative consequences in our physical health. Fearfulness, this prolonged fear 
can lead to heart palpitations, dizziness, shortness of breath, stomach pains. It can also have mental symptoms such as a lack of concentration and focus, a preoccupation with whatever is causing that fear, even the inability to perform normal tasks. We can't focus on what we're doing because we're focused on our fear. Fearfulness can lead to sleeplessness, which prolonged leads to a whole host of more serious problems. Just as with other forms of stress, when we live in that constant state of fear and emergency, our health is going to suffer. Two specific manifestations of fearfulness are panic attacks and phobias. Panic attacks are sudden, brief episodes of intense fear with multiple physical symptoms, like we had described before, but without any external threat. Okay, this is where we anticipate something is about to happen, but it's not there. This isn't a real threat. This is one in our minds. Here it's akin to worry. And if you'll remember, back when we talked about worry, what's the percentage of things we worry about that actually happen? A big 8%. (laughs) So oftentimes that fear is unfounded, but it is so overwhelming we panic. It can be a very unexpected, out-of-the-blue experience. I mean, it can just be happening when you're walking, and all of a sudden it overtakes you. And it can last from a few seconds to even a few minutes. And they can occur at any time. Even knowing that you can have another panic attack can lead to a panic attack. (laughs) So it's this vicious cycle that's very difficult to break. Researchers of the National Institute of Mental Health show that anxiety disorders of the panic variety are the number one mental health problem among women today and second only to drug and alcohol abuse among men. That's how prevalent panic attacks are and and this type of fear. Now on the other hand we have phobias and where panic attacks will come on you for a moment and leave, phobias are persistent irrational fears of an object or a situation, and again, fears that present no real threats. Phobias grow out of fear when the fear is excessive and irrational, meaning it's out of proportion to the actual degree of threat. Phobias also grow out of the fear associated with avoidance behaviors, Deliberately doing things differently to avoid being afraid. And it's also associated with a decreased quality of life. We can't enjoy life when we are gripped by fear. When these phobias impair a person's ability to function normally, it's called a phobic disorder. And those suffering with phobic disorders experience the most extreme form of fear. Not only are they in this constant state of hyper-alertness, but also fear continuously controls their activities. It limits their lives and drastically diminishes their quality of life. Now, many of us have phobias. I have two. One is a fear of snakes. I just don't like them. Thankfully, I'm not in a place where I'm around them very often, so it doesn't happen very often. The other one is a fear of heights. And and I'll be honest with you, my fear of heights is so bad that if I'm watching television and the camera pat, you know, pans over like they go over a cliff and there's you know, ma- I can feel myself leaning back in my chair. I, feel, I can get lightheaded and dizzy. And you want to talk about irrational? I'm not even there, okay? There is no threat, and yet it affects me that way. 
I don't know how you get over that. It's just how fear can operate in our lives. They call that acrophobia. Okay. There's claustrophobia. Many people fear claustrophobia. Being put in a confined space, right? Now, this can be a real problem if you have to have an MRI or a CAT scan because you feel very enclosed. And there are people who have to be medicated before they can have one of those scans. That's what fear can do to us. And it's something many, if not all, of us deal with at some point or another. There's also uh, agoraphobia. We don't want to be around people. We don't want to be in large crowds. And for some, that gets to the point where you can become homebound. You're afraid to leave your house because you're afraid of what's going to happen on the outside. So this is what fear can be in our lives. Now, if I were to ask you the question, what do you fear? We would have many different answers shaped by our experiences, our present circumstances, even our temperament. But I want to focus on three dimensions of fear. Three areas, very broad areas, where we can feel threatened and where fear can grip us. Those three areas are safety, significance, and security. And there are many specific fears that would fall under one of these categories. We fear losing our safety when we confront threats to our health and even life itself. And again, this is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a God-given instinct to run from danger, avert an accident, or protect ourselves and others. This is the kind of fear that makes you look both ways before you cross a street, or turn the power off before you work on something electrical. At least we're supposed to, right? (laughs) Not everybody does that. But this is a rational, self-preserving kind of fear. The problem with fearing for our safety is when we obsess over it, when it paralyzes us. Proverbs 22.13 speaks of one who never accomplishes anything because he says, there's a lion outside, or I'll be murdered in the streets. Now, it's probably not too likely that we're going to confront a lion outside in central Illinois, But you could be murdered in the streets. I mean, that's happening everywhere. But when we allow that fear to keep us from doing anything, we'll never get out of bed in the morning. We we can allow it to paralyze us so that we will not even try at all. Hebrews 2.15 refers to those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Ever known somebody like that? They're so scared of death, you could say they're scared to death of death. And they're unwilling to live because they're afraid they're going to die. They're afraid that something's going to happen to them and it's going to end their lives. It's like the person who said, I heard that most car accidents happen within 40 miles of home, so I moved 50 miles away. Yeah, think about that one. But the truth is, people fear death more than anything else. The whole trouble about our attitude toward death is that we concentrate on what is to happen to us rather than what we should be doing. We're subject to fear because our eyes are in the wrong direction. We look at what we cannot control instead of what we can. And that is what we're going to see as one of the key factors in overcoming fear. Not focusing our attention on what we can't control. 
And ultimately, our, our physical death is something that is in God's hands. It is not something we need to obsess about. Now, aside from the fear of a loss of safety, many people fear losing significance or security. These are two basic needs that everybody has. We need to feel significant. We need to feel like we matter in the world. And we need to feel secure that we are loved no matter what. But we often fear that these needs are going to be threatened or not met at all. We're afraid we're going to lose our job. We're afraid we're going to lose a spouse, either to death or to divorce. We're afraid that our children will move away or they'll no longer love us. When the economy turns bad, we fear our financial security. Now, I'm not saying that these things are bad in and of themselves. The problem is that they are, again, outside the realm of our responsibility. We fear what we cannot control or even predict. And when our lives become dominated by fear, that triggers the stress response in our bodies and a prolonged exposure to that can ultimately damage our health. So many people are afraid of losing their health that they're damaging their health by being afraid. (laughs) It's, It's counterproductive. So what can we do about it? That's the bottom line. And the good news is we can defeat fear. It does not have to be our master The Bible is filled with verses that tell us, fear not, do not be afraid. Lloyd John Ogilvy has said in his book, Facing the Future Without Fear, there are 366 fear nots in the Bible, one for every day of the year and even one to cover leap year. Think about that. 366 times in the Bible it says, do not fear, do not be afraid. You say, yeah, but isn't that a natural reaction to things? I can't always control that. And that's true. The Bible is not saying we should never feel afraid. It's saying don't stay afraid. Don't focus on your fear. Do not let fear control you. If I can paraphrase the words of God to Cain, he was talking about the temptation of anger. I think it also applies to fear. It is crouching at your door. It desires to control you, but you must master it. Same is true for fear. And, thankfully, we have the resources to do it. Deuteronomy chapter 20 speaks directly against phobias and panic attacks. It doesn't actually use those terms, but it speaks to the issue. Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 3. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not be terrified or give way to panic before them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. The people of Israel were about to go into a land where they were outnumbered. They had less weapons to fight with. They had every reason, humanly speaking, to fear. And God says, do not fear them because God is with you. God will give you the victory. When you focus on your fear, your panic will increase. When you focus on your faith, your heart 
will be at peace. It's all about what we focus on. You focus on your fear, your faith diminishes. You focus on your faith, your fear diminishes. One of the great promises we have is found in Romans 8.15. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. Here he is speaking of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Now notice he says, a slave again to fear. Truth is, we're all slaves to fear when we don't have God. When Christ is not in our lives, it's natural that we're going to be slaves to a fear of death or a whole host of other fears in our lives. But we don't have that spirit anymore. We have the spirit of adoption, the spirit of sonship, the spirit that says you are a child of God. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And if he did that, what do you have to be afraid of? Another passage is that speaks of that slavery to fear. I, I mentioned it earlier. It's in Hebrews chapter 2. I'd like to include verse 14. Speaking of Christ, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the fear of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. One of the reasons Jesus died on the cross, took our sins upon himself, and died, was to defeat death. And when we understand that death is defeated, what is there to fear? Death has already been conquered. We need not live in fear. Understand that death is a part of life. Death is going to happen. In this same book of Hebrews, over in chapter 9, verse 27 says, Man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. I remember the King James version of that. It is appointed unto man once to die. We have an appointment with death. I heard something on the news or a commercial this last week on television that talked about how such and such has saved lives. I got to thinking about that. It's not so much saving life as it is postponing death, isn't it? You might save somebody's life, but that's only a temporary thing because we're going to die. I'm not trying to be morbid. It's just the truth. And I think we need to understand and accept the fact our time on this earth is limited. There's going to come an expiration date for all of us. We don't know when that is. So accept it. And I think accepting the fact of death is maybe the first step in overcoming the fear of it. Realizing that it's going to happen. And that Christ has already been there and he has conquered it for us. Death is an appointment that cannot be avoided. There's an old legend that tells of a merchant in Baghdad who one day sent his servant to the market. And a short time later, the servant comes back and he's all agitated. And he says to his master, Master, may I, may I have a horse, please? I must flee. And the master says, What, what happened? What, what's going on? And the, the servant says, When I was in town at the market, I saw death. And death pointed at me and, and had this, this fearful expression. I must run. I, I, I want to take a horse and, and ride off. 
and get as far away from death as I can. And so the master says, okay, uh, I, I will give you a horse. He says, I'm riding off to Samara, which is a town very many miles away. Well, whatever the master sent the servant into town for, he didn't get. So the master went himself. He goes into town. As he's getting what he needs, he sees death. And he goes to death and says, why did you frighten my servant today and, and make a threatening gesture to him? And death said, oh, that wasn't a threatening gesture. My look was a look of surprise because I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. Yeah. We have an appointment with death. And because we have Jesus, because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow, even if tomorrow is my last day on earth. There's no need to fear. Because to live is Christ, and to die is what? Gain. It's a promotion. We really have nothing to fear. Real safety can only be found in God's presence. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we are safe because we're in him. Safety is not found in seeking an escape from his appointments. Instead of living in the fear of death, we realize it's a part of life. Psalm 139, one of the most comforting, wonderful psalms that you'll find in the scripture. Verse 16 says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Think about that. God knew our life before we were even born. And notice it says, all of the days. God knows before we're born when we will die. It's all a part of his plan. And believe you me, if we have a God appointment with death, nothing is going to take us before that time, and nothing's going to prevent that from happening. I'm not saying we live in a fatalistic sense. Live in the sense that God is in control of this. And as long as I'm here on earth, I've got a purpose for living. God has some reason for me to be here because when that purpose is completed, he's going to take me home. And when he does, it's going to be gain. It's going to be a promotion. It's going to be glory. There is no need to fear. Jesus says in Revelation 1.18, I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in the grave. Satan does not hold the keys of death. He holds the fear of death, not death itself. Only God determines when a life on earth comes to a conclusion. Do we trust him? If we trust him, Why are we afraid? David wrote a wonderful prescription for fearfulness in Psalm 27. If you'll turn to that with me. Psalm 27. I remember in junior high or high school having to memorize this psalm. And it is is a beautiful, beautiful reassurance. Psalm 27, beginning in verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies advance against me to... I'm sorry. When my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. 
Psalm 23, 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 56 says, When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. You say, that's a contradiction because you said, when I am afraid. (laughs) Yes, when the feeling of fear grips me, I will choose to trust in the Lord. And then I will not fear. It goes on to say, you have delivered my soul from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. As long as he has a plan for you on earth, nothing can stop you. You are immortal until God's plan for you is done. And when it is done, he will promote you to glory. Isn't that a great way to look at life? What is there to fear? What about our significance and our security? Read on in Psalm 27. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high on a rock. Then my head will be exalted above my enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. What can be more significant than knowing and seeking the Lord? David writes, he will be exalted above his enemies. Respect, appreciation, fulfillment, these are all attainable for the purpose for which we were created. Verses 7 through 10 speak of our basic need of security. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says if you seek his face, your face, Lord, will I seek. Do not hide your face from me, nor do not turn your servant away in anger, for you have been my helper. Do not reject or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Think about that. Even the most basic relationship on earth, a parent to a child, even if that goes away, God will still receive you. Our security should not be based in our human relationships, but in our relationship with God, because that will not change. We have nothing to fear. True significance and security are available only to the Christian, one who's trusting in Christ's perfect life and substitutionary death as a sole basis of acceptance before a holy God. When the resources of God are not available because of unbelief, that individual is left with no hope of genuine significance or security. Life has neither purpose nor unconditional love apart from the Lord. People then develop alternative strategies for learning to feel as worthwhile as they can. But because these strategies never truly work and because they often run up against obstacles, people do not enjoy significance or security, two elements which all of us desperately need if we are to live effective, productive, creative, and fulfilled lives. These human needs that we all have can be met in Christ. And it's the fear of losing or lacking these needs that often drives the fear factor. I recall a time in my life when I faced a real threat not just to my security, but to my safety. It was the one time that I can really point to and say, I feared for my life. And in those hours, the truth of Romans 8 came to mind. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. 
What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If God is for us, who cares who's against us? He is mightier than all. We have nothing to fear. So I ask you this morning, What are you afraid of? Jesus is saying to all of us, it is I. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Whatever it is that has got you gripped in fear, understand, God is greater than anything I fear. God has promised to give me the things that I'm afraid of losing. And he won't take it back. We can live free of fear. Even in this Halloween season, we do not have to be gripped by fear. We don't have to be haunted by our past or our present or our future. We don't have to be spooked by shame ghouled by guilt, fooled by false guilt, gripped by grief, or freaked by fear, we can live free. We can live fully. We can live for Christ. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, your great promises are true. You have promised us to provide all that we need. We need not fear because we are in your hands. I pray that can be a reality for all of us and that our testimony of a fearless life can be a light to those who still live in the dark, those whose lives are gripped, they're held in slavery by their fear of death, their fear of losing what is important. We know we need not fear because our faith is in you. I pray that can be a reality in each of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.